Hi there. Welcome to Headwaters Science Institute's Lunch with a Scientist. Join us as we talk with working scientists from all over the world as we explore what science research in their career actually looks like. We will host a new scientist every other week and allow them to present their research and follow that up with an open-ended question and answer session. We hope exposure to these professionals will allow students to not only see what type of research is possible, but also see what kinds of careers are accessible. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun along the way. I often refer to Stacy as my real life Indiana Jones friend because she has the coolest job. Florida used to be a lot bigger than it is today. Most of that uh, ancient land is now underwater. We know that people have been living in Florida for at least 12,000 years. So it was this world of villages and mounds and homesteads, seasonal movement, fishing and shell fishing, that the Spanish encountered when they arrived in the region. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Lunch with a Scientist. Today, we are joined by Sarah, or Stacy Barber. She is an anthropological archaeologist with a long-term interest in how human beings interact with coastal ecosystems. She has conducted research on the coast of Oaxaca in southern Mexico since 2000. That work looks at the origins and organization of urban societies and coastal settings. Dr. Barber has also conducted research since 2017 on the east coast of Florida, where she and collaborators are evaluating the history of human occupation and resource on the Indian River Lagoon. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and welcome Dr. Barber. Hi, Stacey. How are you today? Hi, Jen. It's nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited for everybody to get to hear about your really cool work you're doing. Um, often refer to Stacy as my real life Indiana Jones friend because <laughs> that's the coolest job. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring in her presentation and she's going to go ahead and start by talking about how she got involved in her career and tell you about all of the research that she's doing. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to be here. I love talking about my research. I've been an archaeologist or involved in archaeology since the 1990s, so a really long time. And I have been passionate about archaeology since I was in the third grade. So um, I've been really com committed to archaeology for a long time. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my history in just a second, but I wanted to start before I go very far into this by talking about the complicated history of Florida, which is where I'm joining you from. I want to acknowledge that the land around the Indian River Lagoon uh, and the Indian River Lagoon itself, which I'm going to talk about today, were part of the ancestral and traditional territory of several indigenous groups. And I'm obviously not an indigenous American. So it's really important that I and others who do research on the indigenous past acknowledge the Ais, Soruque, Ulame, uh, and other tribes of Florida and their descendants, such as the Seminole tribe of Florida and the Miccosukee tribe of Indians. And this is something that all archaeologists today uh, are working on doing a better job of recognizing that um, many of the people that we talk about are lost because of the diseases and um, violence of the conquest that happened uh, over the last four to 500 years. Um, but without further ado then, let me tell you about my research and, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about my background as well as I do that. Thank you. So I've already mentioned that the Seminole tribe and the Miccosukee tribe uh, are both still um, alive and well and very involved in the archaeology of Florida. The complex, his complex history of Florida, and I should add that everywhere in the Western Hemisphere has really complex history, is precisely what I want to talk about today. And I'm going to talk about my collaborative research on the Florida coast but what I really want to do today is I want to convince you guys that the past matters. And I don't mean the past as in like last year or the last few years, all of the past. All of us are living in a world that was created by the past. But surprisingly, we tend to take a really narrow view of the past when we're thinking about where we are now and what we're going to do in the future. And that narrow view is a real problem when we want to make important decisions, like where we're going to put new houses or how we're going to improve our water quality or what species to protect in, in our environment. What past should we be using and why should we be using that past? 
So there are lots of different ways to study the past scientifically. I'm an archaeologist, as I've already mentioned, and that means that I'm interested in human beings. I study past people by looking at the things they ate, they used, and they made. And the pictures here show various examples of my research. Um, in the upper left, that's one of my field research team or members of my field research team uh, collecting information from that uh, hole in the ground that you can see there. There's um, some ancient pottery on the bottom left. On the bottom right, or, mic or the top right, pardon me, are microscopic plant remains. And I want to be really clear that I don't study dinosaurs, mammoths, or any extinct animals, unless, of course, humans killed them and ate them. Then I do care about those animals. But the people who study ancient animals are paleontologists. Geologists also study the past, but they look at the surface of the earth and what's beneath it. And then there are historians who study the past using texts, that is, books, letters, other historical documents. And all of us who study the past work together because the past is really hard to reconstruct. And I also collaborate a lot with other scientists and social scientists who might not even think to study the past, like ecologists or biologists, but I convince them that they should study the past too. So I've been studying the past for over 25 years, and today I'm a college professor. I work at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, and I started my archaeology career as a college student, which is when I learned the methods for conducting archaeological research. I've conducted research in Honduras, El Salvador, Colorado and Utah, Mexico, and most recently in Florida. I attended graduate school and got a master's degree and a doctoral degree. It's really important to know, though, that most archaeologists aren't college professors like me. Most of them work in effectively construction, and they work for state and federal governments. They identify historic and ancient sites that should be protected from construction projects like cell phone towers or high-rise buildings. So I'm responsible for teaching future generations of archaeologists. My students learn in part from participating in or working with data from my research projects about the past. I'm particularly interested in how past people lived along and affected the ecosystems of coastal regions, like the one shown here on the bottom right in Oaxaca, Mexico. As an example of what I'm talking about, I'm going to use the Indian River Lagoon, or IRL for short, because Indian River Lagoon takes a long time to say. And I'm going to use that um, lagoon from Florida as a case study to explain why the past matters. I'm the lead on an interdisciplinary research program that's focused on the IRL and on another lagoon in Pacific Mexico. So I'm studying both regions. I want to quickly introduce my research team, tell you about its goals, and so you understand the work, the scale of the work that we're undertaking. Then I want to describe the long-term history of the IRL, especially the area around what is now Cape Canaveral. Cape Canaveral is obviously better known for a place where we launch rockets, but there's a ton of ancient human activity in that same area. We'll start in the Ice Age and we'll come all the way up to the present. So I'll discuss the IRL's history and the archaeological and interdi interdisciplinary research my team is doing around the lagoon. And then finally, I want to make a really quick trip through the last 500 years and talk about the future. What challenges does this lagoon face and what path should we use to understand its future? The IRL is a shallow estuary that extends 156 miles north-south along the east coast of Florida. It is so long that it transitions from a temperate to a tropical ecosystem. That makes it one of the most species diverse estuaries in all of North America. The photo here is from one of the archeological sites where my team works. My team's collaboration aims to understand changes in the social and environmental conditions of the IRL over the past 10,000 years. So, you know, not a long time. And our long-term goals include first documenting the geological, hydrodynamic, and ecological change that has taken place in the northern part of the IRL, because again, 156 miles long, we're only going to look at about half of it, 
and evaluating the ways in which human populations have both generated changes and responded to changes in the lagoon. This figure here on the right is a satellite image of the lagoon, and it shows locations where we have data from. The two blue triangles down at the bottom, the Penny Plot and the Burns Mound, are where I do my field research. I have geological data from the two yellow dots and the pink dot. And then other archaeologists have worked at the other blue triangles up in the north, Seminole Rest and Castle Windy. So what we're doing is a big ask. 10,000 years of history in a single place. So we needed a team working together to get there. I can't report on what everyone in the team is doing. I'm going to talk about archaeology because that's my thing. But basically, archaeology provides information on past animals, including fish and bivalves like oyster. And there's some examples of archaeologists at work. The ages of these um, the fish and bivalve bones, the oyster, the oyster shell, uh, contain, are obtained from radiocarbon dating, and they offer a glimpse of what species were living in the IRL at different points in the past. The geologic vibracore sample, and that's what they're doing in the middle, and it really does look like a construction site, it's a record of sediment, so sand and mud, deposited across the lagoon and the coastal floor of the ocean over 9,000 years. So we have 9,000 years of history from that. And then phytoliths are these microscopic plant silica. They're little bits of glass. And there's an example there on the bottom right. Those are distinct to family, genus, or even species. And those are buried in the core. And they tell us what plants were living in the lagoon over time. We combine these data sources to characterize past ecological conditions and human resource use at known points in the past. So 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Let me tell you a little bit today about what we and others have learned so far and where we plan to go in the future. So my subtitle is a little bit of a red herring. The IRL is only about 6,000 years old. Cape Canaveral, which is shown there on the image, and the barrier islands around it that form the Indian River Lagoon are actually little spits of sand that have formed via the movement of ocean currents since Florida was flooded by ocean at the end of the last ice age. Florida used to be a lot bigger than it is today. Most of that uh, ancient land is now underwater. If we look closely, we can even see the remnants of ancient shorelines as the barrier islands got wider over time and created the coastline that we see today. Geologists have actually developed ways to date each of the ancient dune ridges, and that's what these, there's little lines that you'll see on the map here. All of those individual lines are ancient beach fronts. By dating those different beach fronts, we can see that Cape Canaveral, which is that point or that triangle there in the right, has been growing eastward and southward for 5,000 years. The very oldest beach fronts are on the western side next to the Banana River. Similar processes have been underway all up and down the Atlantic coast of Florida for thousands of years. Around the Mosquito Lagoon, which I'm showing here, researchers, researchers have shown that there used to be a bunch of inlets where ocean water and fresh water would mix behind the barrier islands. The most recent of those inlets closed around 1,500 years ago, which isn't really that long ago in the greater scheme of things. So people living around the lagoon had to adjust where they lived to accommodate the water channels. And all that fresh or all of that salty water would have changed the kinds of plants and animals that thrived in the lagoon and around its shoreline. So changes like this wouldn't have been massive, but they certainly would have affected where people lived and what kinds of food they could find. So let's talk about those people. We know that people have been living in Florida for at least 12,000 years. So that's why 1,500 years, not a long time. There are very old archaeological sites on the mainland in this area of Florida, including the Windover Pond site, which you can just see at the top of the slide, and the old Vero site down at the bottom of, this, of the image. Both of these sites are older than the lagoon, so the people who live there lived in a very different version of Florida. Windover is what is known as a charnel pond, where people sometimes buried their dead at the bottom of the pond, and they did so between 8,000 and 7,000 years ago. 
at least 168 people were buried in Windover Pond. At the old Vero site, recent research has shown that hunting gathering people spent some time camped on the banks of a small stream there, again between 8,000 and 6,000 years ago. We know that these early Floridians hunted and fished locally available game. They made cloth and basketry from the fibers of plants like the stable palm, which is a native palm to Florida, and they gathered many edible plants that were available. These are examples of the kinds of tools and even the basketry that we would find at a site like Windover or Old Vero. And that's how people lived in Florida for a really long time. They often lived, lived along rivers or around lakes because there would be fresh water and fish available all the time. They may have visited the coasts, but there's no evidence that they were doing any offshore fishing, so they weren't getting in boats. And without the lagoons, the coast didn't have nearly the appeal that the inland waterways would have had. People adapted to changes in the climate, which included wetter and warmer periods than today and cooler and drier periods. It was probably a pretty good life. I mean, we're living in Florida, don't have a lot to do except go catch some fish. Everything changed around 6,000 years ago though, when sea levels around the world finally stabilized about where they are today. From that point on, there was this slow buildup of sand to create the lagoons and the ecosystem of the Atlantic coast around Cape Canaveral. However, because of all that sand buildup, it's really hard for us to say how much use the lagoons were getting for several thousand years. So you can see I have a big question mark in the middle of my timeline there. There are a few sites around, but we just have these huge gaps in our knowledge until around 500 BCE, which is when humans really start to use the coast regularly. Before I go any further, I just want to take a minute to talk about how archaeologists talk about when things happened in the past. We to use two different methods. We can use the Eurasian calendar system of BCE slash CE, so before the Common Era or the Common Era. Used to be BCAD, but we don't use that anymore. Or we can simply talk about years ago. And because most of us are pretty comfortable with the Common Era, this is the year 2022 of the Common Era, as we get closer in time, it's just easier to say BCE and CE. So back to my basic timeline, we have this huge gap about which I really can't tell you very much. But after 2,500 years ago, archaeological sites become a lot more common around the northern part of the IRL. When you visit the lagoon, you can see archaeological sites everywhere. There are these huge piles of seashells stacked one atop another, like the example here on the right. These shell middens, which are they're typically called, are places where people either spent a few days camping and eating shellfish, or where people spent a few days removing the meat from fish, oysters, clams, conchs. They smoked it or salted it, and then they took it back to the other members of their community who might have been camped somewhere else. The density of shell, and this, this um, pile of shell on the right is taller than me, so it's like six or seven feet tall. It shows that these activities, this camping and fishing and camping and fishing, happened again and again for decades or even centuries. In some places, you will literally see miles of shoreline littered with tossed out shells. And that's all the white stuff in that slide on the right. That's all seashell that was tossed out by ancient Floridians. These places don't only remind us that people you, other people used to live and use the lagoon, they're an amazing snapshot of the animal species that lived in the lagoon over time and a demonstration of the productivity of the lagoon in the past. It, it's just amazing how much food people pulled from these lagoon waters. Let me give you an example. The Mosquito Lagoon is the northernmost part of the Indian River Lagoon. Today, Mosquito has only one outlet to the sea, way up at the Ponce Inlet near New Smyrna Beach. But if you look at the geology, there used to be many more breaks in that barrier island, other inlets. And while the research that these inlet locations are based on is actually quite old, and frankly, my team needs to update it, at least our current estimates are that there used to be five other inlets allowing fresh and marine water to interact in the lagoon. These closed at some point in the past, but we think that perhaps the most recent one closed around 550 of the common era. 
Now, I mentioned a moment ago that the general environmental conditions of the IRL haven't changed for about 6,000 years since sea levels stabilized. But the result of several research projects, including that of my team, suggest that there were smaller scale changes that may have resulted from geologic changes like the closing and opening of inlets. And those smaller changes were likely enough to affect how people could and did use the IRL. This image shows changes in the kinds of plants that were living around the lagoon over time. So on the left, you see a count of those tiny phytoliths of tree species and grass species. So the red, which is arboreal, and the green is grasses, arboreal being trees. I showed a picture of a phytolith earlier, and you can think of them as sort of the bones of plants. They're made of silica, like glass, and they allow plants to hold their shapes. So you see this clear trend. As grass declines, which you see on the left-hand side, the arrow kind of going, well, for you guys, it would be going this way. <laughs> um, as the grass declines, the trees increase. This is exactly what you would expect as there's less salt marsh space and more fresh or dry land around our sampling site. And our sampling site is that little pink dot down at the bottom of the lagoon. So if less seawater is getting into the southern end of the lagoon, there are less opportunities for plants like grasses that want salt water to grow. And while sea grasses have actually started making a comeback, you can see the line going this way at the top of the slide, they're still nowhere near the levers they were before 500 of the common era. These small changes almost certainly created differences in the animals available to people as food. Archaeological evidence from shite sites shown here on the map of the Mosquito Lagoon indicate changes in species that people preyed upon following the inlet closures. You can see the lagoon archaeological sites there at the top. So what we see is that leading up to about 750 of the Common Era, Eastern oysters and saltwater clams made up nearly 100% of the shellfish that people were discarding. But later, approximately 200 years after the Turtle Mound Inlet closed, so that last mound closed, indigenous peoples ate a much greater mix of species, including saltwater clams, specifically a kind called coquina, uh, which is a very small oceanfront clam, and to a lesser extent, saltwater mussels. So this table here shows you changes over time. The earlier, level, the earlier um, species use is on the top of the chart, and the lower one is at the bottom of the chart. And you can see that there's a radical decrease in some species over time. So human use of oysters plummeted from 50% of all shellfish to just 6%. In terms of fish, a variety of different species of fish, including jacks and catfish, were more commonly harvested prior to 750 of the Common Era, while mullet, catfish, sea trout, and drum species were more common after. And that's, you can see the arrows pointing up for those species. Another interesting thing that we see is that the size of clams changes over time. Parsons measured the size of clam shells over uh, a relatively long period of time. And we see a slow, steady decline in the size of the oysters that humans are, are gathering from the lagoon. Parsons argues that this decline reflects human over-exploitation over time. So we see the size of the clams getting smaller and smaller because the large ones are no longer available. Humans have already killed all of those and eaten them. While we have many more questions than answers right now, it is certainly suspicious that just as people shifted from oysters to other kinds of shellfish, clams seem to have been particularly hard hit. So what we have is people adapting to small scale changes in their environment caused by geological processes. And some of their actions in turn affected the ecosystem around them. By about 1300 of the common era, you have people using the lagoon shores in at least three distinct ways. They're gathering and eating fish and shellfish, but not spending extended periods of time in sort of in small scale encampments. 
They had homesteads that, that may have shifted seasonally. So they might spend the winter out on the barrier island and then the summer when the hurricanes come on the mainland, which would obviously be safer. And then you also have villages, sometimes mount, with mounds made of shell and sand into which the dead were being buried. And while populations were much lower than they are today around the IRL, homesteads and mound villages would certainly have affected the environmental conditions of their surrounding areas. The burn site on Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, shown there in the red star, is along the east bank of the Banana River. And it's an example of a village with a burial mound. Oh, there were many more sites like the burn site, but those mounds have all unfortunately been destroyed. This is what the Burns Mound looks like today. It's much lower and wider than it would have been in uh, the pre-Hispanic period. And this is a result of damage from construction in the 20th century. It's protected from additional disturbance and is a location where indigenous human remains from around sites around Cape Canaveral and Patrick Air Force Base properties can be respectfully reburied. And so in that foreground, you'll see sort of a, a low mound right next to the fence. That's a modern construction into which we put important materials, including human remains, at the request of the Seminole and Miccosukee tribes. From 27 to 2019, I and other UCF faculty working with Mr. Tom Penders of the U.S. Space Force have been studying Burns and other sites on the Banana River. And I can't tell you everything we've done at Burns, but I do want to make a few observations about why we think, uh, what we think indigenous Floridians were doing here in the final centuries before European contact in the 1500s. So what you're looking at here is imagine if we just took a a saw and cut right through that mound. This drawing shows the mound as it would have looked when it was excavated by archaeologists way back in the 1930s. What researchers found them, and that we have recently been able to confirm, is that the mound was built on top of land that had already been in use by indigenous people. It was already probably a village site. Our radiocarbon dates put that early occupation between 1100 and 1300 of the common era probably as a homestead site type site. The mound itself was built after 1300 and it was used at least into the 1500, so after the Spanish were starting to sail the waters of Florida. 52 people were buried in half of the mound that was excavated in the 1930s. And the upper portions of the mound contained high quality quantities of ash and shell, indicative of parties, basically. The indigenous people of eastern Florida were preparing and consuming huge amounts of food in the lagoon, probably in, in part to celebrate the lives of the dead who were buried in the mound. What's really interesting is the huge number of species that were being taken from the lagoon and also the land animals that were being, hunting, or being hunted. So food refuse near the mound is dominated by fish and shellfish followed by land animals, including turtles. But there were smaller numbers of amphibian, reptile, invertebrate, dolphin, and bird species found near the mound. There are at least 30 different species of fish with mullet, weak fish, catfish drum, pinfish, sheephead, sheep's head, and burfish being the most numerous identified species. But we also found exotic species like skates, stingrays, shark, and pufferfish. There were approximately 35 different species of shellfish with coquina, remember those little clams I mentioned before, quahog clams, which are the bigger clams, and other saltwater clam species as the most common. But there are also six different species of conch and whelk, which are univalves with the spiral core, including true whelk, the Florida crown conch, and the knobbed whelk. Animals that were eaten at the site included white-tailed deer, rabbits, raccoons, opossums, and the bones from at least three different black bears. And that's really unusual. Bears are not a common, were not a common food for indigenous Floridians. And there were also six different turtle species being eaten. The most common being the indigenous or the native Floridian gopher tortoise. And let's face it, the gopher tortoise is really early, easy to catch. They're very slow. So let me just take a moment 
to tell you what I think about all this information and what it means in terms of the past of the Indian River Lagoon. First, the Indian River Lagoon didn't even exist until after 6,000 years ago. So in this region, the past has a really nice starting point. People weren't around, were around, but they weren't really using the lagoon in any impactful way for thousands of those 6,000 years. There just weren't that many people in Florida, and there were better places to live inland with fresh water access. Next, the geological changes that started with sea level stabilization after the Ice Age didn't just stop at 6,000 years ago. Instead, we see ongoing transformations of the barrier islands, including inlet closures on Mosquito Lagoon that occurred until 550 CE. That last closure likely influenced what plants and animal species lived in and around the lagoon. Right now, our data enable us to observe a decline in seagrasses and an increase in trees, but there are almost certainly many other changes. And by the 700s of the Common Era, there were a lot more, a lot more people living around the lagoon. Those people, furthermore, made changes to their diet, at least in the Mosquito Lagoon. They stopped relying on oysters and shifted to other, sh other shellfish and new fish species. I would love to tell you today what caused these changes, but we're still in the process of ruling out various options. It could be overexploitation of certain species, or people could have changed their food pre preferences. Perhaps they started to prefer different species over others. Technological changes, the invention of new methods of catching fish or harvesting shellfish could also have ch changed people's diet, or changes in the environment could also have affected what species people relied on. What we can say is that people already appeared to be impacting the species that lived around the lagoon by 1,000 of the co common era as clams got smaller and younger in archaeological sites due to overexploitation. Right, so ecosystem damage isn't something special to us. Ancient people also did this. Finally, indigenous use of the lagoon included landscape modification in the form of clearing land for villages, building mounds that would have affected where water flowed, and the cumulative effect of repeated use of the shorelines for shell discard. You know, all those shell middens with their mounds of shell all along the shore would have affected the drainage and also the stability of the shoreline, whether um, erosion was happening and at what rate. All of these things are impacts on the environment. So it was this world of villages and mounds and homesteads, seasonal movement, fishing and shell fishing that the Spanish encountered when they arrived in the region. Sometimes people treat the past as beginning at this point when Europeans show up. But I hope I've convinced you that to do so is a mistake. History doesn't start with Europeans. It just gets really sad. The indigenous ice who lived in the Indian River Lagoon when the Spanish arrived were torn apart by disease, violence, kidnapping, and enslavement. No self-identified ice exists today. There was a population collapse around the lagoon before Euro-Americans started moving back in in the late 1800s. So the lagoon was essentially a land with very few people living around it for a couple hundred years until after the Civil War. Today, the Indian River Lagoon is characterized as an ecosystem in crisis. This is the most recent report card on water and seagrass quality in the lagoon today. And hopefully you guys can all see all the Fs and the Ds. Those are not grades you want to get at school, and these are certainly not grades that the lagoon wants to be getting. This report card is based on 25 years of data on where seagrasses are growing and 23 years of data on the quality of the lagoon's water. 25 years. I hope I've shown that 25 years tells us very little about what this ecosystem is capable of how this e how, or how the ecosystem we have today does or does not reflect ideal conditions. In fact, what are ideal conditions? Do we start with the point of European contact, the pre-Hispanic period, 
after the 1750s when all of the ice had died or been enslaved, but Europeans hadn't moved in? Or do we all go all the way back to the period just after the ice age? If we want to decide how to build, how to restore, how to clean the water in the Indian River Lagoon, we can look at the past and it will tell us what conditions used to be like, how people, geology, and climate have changed these conditions, and maybe what we shouldn't do to make this lagoon healthy. The past matters. Thank you. And this slide provides a list of the organizations that have provided me with support to do the research. Thank Is that you. too short? No, that was perfect. Okay. I learned so much today. I've lived on the Indian River Lagoon my entire life, and I had no idea of all of this information. Um, I knew about Windover because I live up here where it is. Um, so that was just, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. It was so interesting. Oh, um, awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. No, it was, I think it's just such an important thing. And I love how you presented it with the past matters. And, you know, there might be some, some, pieces to that, which are indications of some of our Indian River Lagoon health. Um, specifically, I found it really interesting with the that we used to have so many more inlets. And, you know, looking at the scale of geologic time, it really doesn't seem that long ago that they were there. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate a little bit on the closure of those inlets or maybe how that occurred? Yeah, sure. So this is one of the things I think a lot of people um, when they first start dealing with uh, what we would call historical sciences, like archaeology, like geology, like um, uh, history, paleontology, they have trouble conceptualizing like how much past there is, if that makes sense. Like the present day is just such a short period of time. And even the last hundred years is a drop in the bucket. And so to really understand the conditions that we're living in today, you have to like expand your vision of the past to to go from what we would call historic time, which would be periods when we have written records, to geologic time, which includes all of the many thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of years over which uh, life and um, modern geology have formed the landscape that we experience. In the Indian River Lagoon, um, it's essentially ocean currents pulling sand from shorelines elsewhere, like up the coast in Florida or down the coast in Florida, and kicking that sand back on land that has created the barrier islands. And then um, because, well, I mean, the barrier islands are literally just spits of sand, which we've built all over, which in and of itself is like a whole terrible idea, probably. Um, but all that you need is one really big storm with the currents moving just the right way and perhaps um, a low lying area and the ocean will push right through and create an inlet. And so that's how they're formed. And then they're, they'll fill in the same way. You can actually have a storm that instead of pulling sand away from the beach, pushes sand onto the beach and it can fill an inlet. Well, yeah, it's just, it's just so interesting because every time I think about you know, the past, it just, like I said, so long ago, and this is all pretty recent when in comparison to what we're used to talking about, you're saying with dinosaurs and all that millions and millions of years, mm -hmm. like this is so much closer and it's just so interesting. So going on to that, you know, how do you really determine what locations that you're going to research? So you said the you Inerva know, Lagoon is 156 miles long. Like, so how do you know specifically which location? <laughs> to go and study on that massive amount of space. Yeah, you know, the Indian River Lagoon is a good example of um, the challenges that we have deciding where to do research in some ways because it's so big. And there hasn't, in some parts of America and, in, and other parts of the Western hemisphere, there's been a lot of research done, right? So you, we know a lot about already about the history of parts of, for instance, the Gulf Coast of Florida or the Southwestern United States. But the Indian River Lagoon is a part of Florida that just hasn't been studied. Its history hasn't been very well studied. And so it's, it, I don't know a lot about where all of the sites are and I don't know a lot about when those sites date to. So it, it was sort of a, a function of um, having the right 
relationships with other researchers who had access to archaeological sites, and then also Canaveral National Seashore and the Space Force Station. The US federal government has very strict rules about what kinds of development it can and can't do. So archaeological sites tend to be in better shape, and there tend to be more of them on places like national parks and, and of military bases of all places. So if you want to get a good picture of a place like the Indian River Lagoon, you don't want the Southern Lagoon because that's all built up, right? It's got towns all around the lagoon, but this patch of the Northern Lagoon doesn't have towns. And so the archeological sites are still right there and they're in pretty good shape. Um, and going along with that, I found it really interesting. You were showing all those shells just built up and you're like, if you look in the woods here, there's like, we see those all the time. So how can you determine if those are from ancient civilizations and not more recently? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of different ways. The first way is, um, so the, the big piles of shell, the middens, like the one that I showed very early in the PowerPoint, those are not something that form naturally, like they're just too dense. And they often have things like bits of pottery inside of them. And it's not pottery that's made today, right? If they had glass or, or nails or something in it, we'd know it was modern. But because they have what is all is pre-Hispanic pottery, so pre-European contact pottery, we know that the, the midden formed at that time. Those middens kind of fade off, and then you have these thick trails of shell that just go up and down the shoreline. Those can form in two ways. One, it can be people, or it could be a big storm, right? Storm surges bringing stuff up onto shore. The thing is, conch shells are heavy, and so it would have to be a really bad hurricane to give you like a big pile of conch shells on the shoreline. And then often um, the conch shells and some of the other shells will have like chips and stuff or cutouts in them where humans were cutting into the shell to get the meat out or if they were using the shell as uh, a tool. And so when you see things that humans have clearly modified and they're all piled together on the shoreline, you can say, ah, this is something people did. And since we don't use conch shells as tools today, we can safely say that it's an indigenous technology. Yeah, and it, uh, some of those conch... Do, are they even around still? I know that we've over harvested a lot of those species as well. You know, I don't know what the existing proportions of some of these species are, and I'm still trying to find the right data. Um, there are some inventories that have been conducted by other research, researchers at UCF of some of these species, particularly the oysters and the clams, actually. I think there's less information on the conchs, um, but that's proprietary. And so I'm not going to be able to use those data until those researchers um, have published on them. So I'm, I'm just sort of waiting for them to do that. Oh, so something for us to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, one more question. So I know you shared that protected site, the burn site. Um, the burn site, yeah. Yes. So are the other locations that you're working on, are those areas also protected since you were doing research there? Yeah. So um, I think a really good point to make is that archaeological sites all over the United States, if they are on federal or state land, are protected. Right. It is illegal to excavate in those locations. It is illegal to if you find something on the surface and you're in a, like if you're in a national park and you see a, a piece of pottery on the surface, it's actually illegal to remove that stuff. And so um, all of the archaeological sites that I've worked with are on Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. So they are definitely protected both by the federal laws that protect all archeological sites on federal land, but also it's the Space Force Station, right? I have to have a security badge and there's like all this, you know, there's people checking me in and making sure I can come on base. So they're like super duper protected. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, it's good to know that no yeah. one's out there messing with it. Well, we still have to be careful. One of the big problems is if people know where archeological sites are, they'll be like, oh, this is cool. Um, and some will just for interest, you know, dig holes in the sites to find stuff. And some people will actually um, dig into sites and try to find intact things like whole pieces of whole pots and then sell them on eBay, oh. um, which is incredibly destructive. So archeologists are really careful about not giving too much detail on where sites are located specifically to prevent damage like that. Wow. Yeah. So thank you again so much, Stacey, for sharing all of your information with us today. That was just so exciting to hear all those cool things that are going on. Um, you know, we always hear about all the, the paleontology side of things. So it was really interesting to hear the archaeology side of 
the research that's going on right now. So thank you again. Um, and thank you to the University of Central Florida for letting us have you come speak with us today. If you would like more information about our Lunch with a Scientist program, or if you'd like to participate as a scientist with us, you can email me at info at headwaterscienceinstitute.org. And if you would like to join us for our research experience program and do your own uh, research project where you're collecting your own data and you get to work with a mentor in the field, go ahead and visit our website and you can see all the information about our summer research experience program. So thank you again, Stacy, and I appreciate you joining me today. We will have a follow-up activity that goes along with this where you can investigate and act like an archaeologist as well. 